Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to our final component of the day, Down the Mountain, a message from composer John Luther Adams. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that this conference is being hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, which is located on Manahata, the traditional unceded territory of the Lenape. So without further ado, here is Down the Mountain. Down the mountain, the descent beckons, William Carlos Williams. I am walking through a desert on the bottom of the sea. A glint catches my eye. I stop and pick it up. White coral, a shard of a colony of creatures that lived here some 300 to 500 million years ago. I can't comprehend how long ago that was. Yet, by that time, 80 to 90% of Earth's history was already written in stone. This place where I'm standing now wasn't here at all. The Earth beneath my feet was much closer to the equator, rotated 90 degrees on the north-south axis, and submerged under warm tropical waters. I step into the dry stream bed and walk across the floor of naked white limestone, smooth, solid, muffled underfoot. I climb out of the gully and onto the bank, my boots snarling and growling on gravel that washed down from ridges that have long since disintegrated. Towering over me now are red-yellow sandstone cliffs. Above, on either side, loom twin peaks of fractured rhyolite, red-brown, splashed with green lichen. I am walking through cataclysms in repose. The desert and mountains all around me hold the deep memories of catastrophe. The roaring of angry gods, the ground churning like a turbulent sea, maelstroms of searing toxic clouds howling across the land. The violence frozen in these rocks would dwarf our most fearsome weapons. Remote as they may seem now, cataclysms like these will come again, as they have for billions of years. Today, a human cataclysm is raging. Millions of people have died in a worldwide pandemic. Yet, as terrible as this is, this crisis pales in comparison with the turmoil growing all around us. Rising seas, raging wildfires, screaming superstorms, intractable droughts, and mass extinctions, cataclysms of our own making. As unique as we humans may be, we are not exempt from the limits of biology. Our overpopulation and overconsumption, our relentless pursuit of the economics of growth for growth's sake, as David Brower called it, the philosophy of the cancer cell, cannot continue. Our burning of the fossilized remains of life from hundreds of millions of years past is warming the climate of the earth at a lethal rate. The most distinguishing characteristic of the human species is our intelligence. And although our cleverness may yet prove to be our undoing, our best hope for survival still lies within the human imagination, in our capacity for creative thought, of which art is the fullest expression. On the hillside across the way, a band of 26 mule deer are grazing peacefully. I continue scrambling up the slope. My immediate objective is to reach the wind-sheared juniper, that stands alone between the peaks. But the strong winds force me to take shelter behind a rock, one of two tall outcrops that form a stone portal to the saddle. I was awake much of last night, rolling back and forth, trying to turn away from my fear. I fear for my wife and myself. I fear for humanity. 
I fear for the other species of life that we threaten. What I do not fear for is the earth. The earth will endure as it has through countless calamities over the past 4,570,000,000 years. All my life I've felt empowered. In spite of my insecurities, my anxieties and fears, I've always felt as though I could make a difference in the world, that I could do something that somehow matters. Yet, huddling here now, I'm struggling with feelings of helplessness. Surrounded by chaos and gathering darkness in the world of human affairs, pondering the uncertain future of our species, and confronting my own mortality, what can I do? Throughout my life, I've been blessed to live close to the earth, to walk alone in beautiful places. I feel compelled to acknowledge these blessings, to express my gratitude. I feel this not only from a sense of obligation to my fellow humans, but also because this is what life does. Trees and flowers seek the light. Birds sing. Wolves howl across the distance. Each of us, as best we can, voices our answer to creation. Mark Rothko observed that after the Holocaust, objective painting could no longer carry serious meaning. Or, as Donald Judd framed it, after Hiroshima, metaphor was dead. Today, in the face of an impending holocaust of global proportions, what is the meaning of art? How can art maintain its integrity as art and still be of use? How does an artist balance ethics and aesthetics? Can we humans learn to live on this earth, if not without narrative, then perhaps without metaphor? Or at least, can the story be about something larger than us? Rather than looking to the earth as a mirror for our thoughts and our dreams, can we come to understand that we ourselves are the metaphors? That everything we are comes from the earth? Crouching here behind this rock, I'm thinking back, remembering people, places, and music in the charmed journey of my life. I'm also looking ahead, concerned about protecting my wife and myself in our final years, trying to resist despair about the increasingly dark outlook for humanity. Yet, I must surrender both nostalgia and fear. I think again of old Claude Monet in the middle of World War I, almost blind, shuffling out to his garden at Giverny to paint water lilies. Now, I too am old. My eyes are not what they once were. In my left ear, I notice that the music of the crickets is diminished. Like Monet, in my own lesser way, the best thing I can do now, for myself and for other people, is what I've done throughout my life, to follow my art with an ever deeper sense of urgency and devotion. I stand up, face the wind, and begin walking down the mountain. For many years, my music was rising, always rising. Now, everything seems to be falling. More and more, I feel the weight of my own mortality and the decline of contemporary society. The music now is filled with grief. Strangely, this darkness doesn't feel oppressive, but natural, even comforting. An expression not so much of resignation as of acceptance. Each morning in my studio, I greet the sun and begin the day with coffee. Before turning to the work at hand, I sit in the rocker by the bay window, reading or sketching, sipping espresso. For years, I favored the bright, berry tartness of lightly roasted beans. But when that lovely acidity began to distress my stomach, I had to switch to a darker roast. 
It took me a while to adjust to the new flavor, and there are times when I still miss the effervescence of the light roast. Yet, as I've learned to savor the dark, it's occurred to me that something similar has happened in my music. I want it to be dark without bitterness. We live in a society in which art is regarded as a commodity. The Canadian composer R. Murray Schaefer once asserted, Art within the constraints of a system is political action in favor of that system, regardless of content. As much as Schaefer's conviction appealed to me, for years I dismissed his statement as hyperbole. But now, reluctantly, I have to agree. As an artist, I've spent my life working on the edge of this culture that is crumbling like these stones sliding away under my feet. I no longer believe that politics can provide the answers we need. And I have no confidence in technology to save us from the consequences of our wanton ways of living. Ours is an existential, dare I say, a spiritual crisis. I can no longer sustain the hope that art can fundamentally transform this culture. I feel compelled now to step outside, to ground my work in the vision of a new culture that I will never live to inhabit. In whatever time remains to me, I resolve to do whatever I can to help envision that culture and to leave something that may be of use to the future generations who will create it. For the first two billion years of Earth's history, there was no free oxygen. Then, roughly two and a half billion years ago, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, began to photosynthesize sunlight. In time, they became so successful at this new mode of sustaining themselves that their emissions of oxygen created a greenhouse effect, precipitating a global climate crisis in which much of life on Earth, including most cyanobacteria themselves, disappeared. Eventually, with tectonic changes on the surface of the Earth, organic carbon became sequestered on the continental shelves. Atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide dropped, the climate cooled dramatically, and 300 million years of winter followed. When the ice finally began to melt, life re-emerged with the Cambrian explosion. The great proliferation of plants and animals, from tropical swamps and trilobites to dinosaurs, giant sloths, saber-toothed tigers, fish, birds, and the family of humanity. This current moment is unprecedented in the four million year history of hominids. Our continued existence as a species is critically threatened by our own self-destructive behavior. In the eye blink of the past several hundred years, we have pumped massive quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The changes that we have set in motion now threaten much of life on Earth, including ourselves. Not since the cyanobacteria of the great oxidation event has a life form brought itself so close to the brink of extinction. Like the most adaptable of those algae, we may somehow manage to survive the hell that we seem to be creating. But is this really the future we want for ourselves and our future generations? If we are to save ourselves and our descendants, from the worst consequences of this crisis of our own making, we must make immediate, fundamental, and widespread changes to our ways of living. Ultimately, our own survival and that of much of life on Earth may well depend on it. We humans like to tell ourselves that the most distinguishing difference between us and other life forms is our high level of consciousness. If this is true, then perhaps our intelligence gives us a unique capacity to do something that no life form has ever done before. Can we make a fully conscious evolutionary leap? Whenever I descend these slopes, 
I'm aware that I'm pulling them down. With each step, a fan of scree sprays out from under my boot. I am the Anthropocene, walking. Man as a geologic force. How long would it take a solitary walker like me to tear down this mountain? Even if we humans covered it like ants on an anthill, working in endless shifts day and night, would we be only an army of Sisyphuses? Might the earth rise up faster than we could bring it down? Might a single tectonic event erase countless generations of our destructive labors in an instant? No matter what we humans vaingloriously imagine we are doing to the earth, ours is not to save the earth. The earth will endure. The challenge now facing humanity is to save ourselves. Cultures come and cultures go. This one's time has almost run. Can we build a new one from its rubble? As if in response to my dim musings, the canyon wren sings out a long, florid phrase, a shower of descending chromatic tones. I continue down the mountain toward my studio. Okay, um, excellent stuff from John Luther Adams. Um, at this point, um, our fine, our first day has actually been completed. Uh, thank you to everyone who has participated here. I just want to take one moment to thank all the people who uh, were present today. Uh, Barbara McKenzie, our keynote speaker, uh, Stephen Feld, John Luther Adams, uh, and our paper panelists. Uh, please do join us tomorrow when we will feature uh, panels on climate change and multimediality. Uh, we'll also have an interview with composer Christopher Tin, who will be live. Um, and that's about it. Again, thank you so much for your presence, um, for coming to this. It really is. Uh, it's been a great first day and I thank you all. Um, so take care. Have a good night and I'll see you tomorrow.